So here is my most people don't even bother. This is the thing. Hello. Uh, as you can see by the title, this video is interesting. The only times that I did find any advice on what to do for Beyond the Spec, it was just teachers saying, look at the textbooks and they have Beyond the Spec in that. However, when I looked at all that content, it didn't seem very applicable. So what I did is I obviously went through all of that. And then I also went through all of my GCSE books and any content that is not on A-level. I researched that and see, tried to see if I could extend it any further into the A-level knowledge. And then I went through the old spec A-level and wrote up any content from that and then I went through the old spec before the old spec and did the same for that as well. So I did a lot of research and then tried to compile it all to one. Doing the A-level thing was definitely easier than doing the GCSE thing so if you are going to do that I'd advise that. The thing about it being beyond the spec is that it has to be up to A-level standard. I couldn't just write about GCSE things because then you wouldn't get the marks anyway. So I compiled all this together and then I highlighted the key terms that would link to things. I thought I would share that with you now and hopefully it will help. So here is my eight page little booklet that I created. So from everything I compiled together I got cholera, MRSA, heart disease, lung disease like tuberculosis, pulmonary fibrosis, emphysema and asthma, dolly the sheep, the menstrual cycle, thermoregulation, skid, the carbon cycle, pinocytosis, osteoporosis, glycocholiacs, probably didn't pronounce that right, the endosymbiotic theory, kidney dialysis, important plant ions, prolactin, thyroxine, lac repressor and other. I don't think I use anything from that anyway so that's really not important. So I did in total, uh, I've done five essays. The beyond the spec content that I managed to incorporate into the practice essays are the ones that I'm going to tell you to learn because the other ones just really aren't that applicable. I did include the menstrual cycle in one homework essay but that allowed me to take much longer on it than you would actually have in the exam so I don't advise menstrual cycle because it's too big a topic the same way the carbon cycle is too big a topic you'd end up writing a full paragraph on it which you haven't got time for in the exam so these are basically the four that i really do recommend learning these are the ones that you're most likely going to be able to incorporate and this one is an absolute definite i would literally say 100 percent of the time you'll be able to get thermoregulation in because it links to everything don't hold me to that but that is what i would really recommend in my actual exam i wrote about thermoregulation and skid but those were the four when it came down to revision i actually focused on learning because they were the ones i knew i could incorporate Obviously, I would just like to clarify again that you should take everything I say with a pinch of salt and do your own research. Don't take everything I'm saying as is. You should probably be able to find a lot more about this on the NHS website. So, SCID is a severe combined immunodeficiency disease. Basically, means you have no immune system. Like the people that have to live in isolation and completely sterile environments, like a little bubble. Those those people likely suffer with this disease. Can't fight infections. If they get ill, they're going to die, basically. So, this is caused by having a defect in the gene that codes for the ADA enzyme. ADA enzyme is adenosine deaminase. The ADA enzymes would destroy the toxins that would kill the white blood cells so it prevents the white blood cells from being destroyed. However, the enzyme isn't present so the toxins are killing the white blood cells basically. So there are currently they're like trialing or trying to use different types of treatment which includes gene therapy and stem cell treatment. You've got the link to immune system and subsequent antibodies. You've also got the link to enzymes, gene therapy and stem cells. Basically what you learn about gene therapy, the whole steps with the retroviruses and mix them together and stuff like that that is exactly how it applies to SCID. So you'd be able to write that up and completely link it in. If you want me to say it, I'll say it now. I can't look at you and say it at the same time, so I'm literally just going to read what it says. The normal ADA gene is isolated from healthy human tissue using restriction endonucleases. The ADA gene is inserted into a retrovirus. The retroviruses are grown with host cells in the lab to increase their number and hence the number of copies of the ADA gene. The retroviruses are mixed with the patient's T cells. The retroviruses inject a copy of the normal ADA gene into the T cell. The T cells are reintroduced into the patient's blood to provide the genetic code needed to make ADA. T cells have a short life so the effectiveness is limited because it would have to be repeated at intervals. Alternative treatment involves transforming bone marrow stem cells which can divide to produce T cells. This results in a constant supply of the ADA gene and therefore the ADA enzyme. However, this treatment increases the risk of leukemia. So glycocholiac is basically a highly charged outer layer of the plasma membrane. So it's produced from proteins, so you link there, from proteins and sugars. Each cell that makes up the microvilli is covered in glycocholia and this provides protection against liquid food in digestion which is called chyme. Probably didn't pronounce that right again. C-H-Y-M-E. So it contains enzymes to aid the digestion. Bacteria also have glycoliacs on. They have a very thick layer of glycoliacs which helps them to adhere to surfaces and each other in extreme environments. So like repressor. This is the diagram that I always thought of. However, don't hold me to that because it has been a month or so since I last did this and I don't know, it's just the way I thought of it. FYI, 
I got this out of the CGP textbook. So E. coli is a bacterium that can respire. You've got the link to bacteria, you've got the link to respiration, and you've got the link to glucose. It can respire glucose. However, when glucose is not available, it can also respire lactose. To respire lactose, it has to produce the enzyme. That is the B-galactosidase enzyme. However, this enzyme is only produced when it is required. So B-galactosidase is only produced when lactose is present in order to save energy. So this is therefore controlled by a transcription factor, which I think covers this thing. The rules for transcription factors in this is slightly different to what you would learn. However, I got it out of the textbook, so. So basically the lac repressor binds to the DNA, which means it cannot be transcribed, so the enzyme cannot be produced. However, when lactose is present, lactose binds to the lac repressor, which stops it binding to the DNA, so then the DNA can be transcribed and the enzyme is produced. And now this is the big one, thermoregulation. And I'll have to admit, I've probably got most of this information from Mr. Pollock's old spec videos, so you should definitely check that out. Thermoregulation is a type of homeostasis, therefore you can always link it back to homeostasis, whether that's water potential, blood glucose, you know, you've got this in. And this is also the one you should probably know and find the easiest to learn because it is in GCSE. It's just added on a bit more from GCSE. And you've also got like vasodilation, vasoconstriction, all of that to go back into there as well. So ectotherms are cold-blooded and endotherms are warm-blooded. We are warm-blooded, which I always get mixed up because I always think we're cold-blooded because that's what people say. Like, are you so cold-blooded? So then I think cold-blooded, not. So the hypothalamus contains the thermoregularity centre, which is divided into heat gain centre and the heat loss center. The stimulus is detected by thermoreceptors and the signal is passed along to the hypothalamus, which activates a change by the autonomic nervous system via negative feedback. So we have different responses to heat and to the cold. The response to gain heat would be vasoconstriction, decrease in sweating, increased metabolic rate, and then shivering. Now, this is the thing where I think is a really, really good point if it's correct. And I tried to double check this and triple check it. I could not find anything online that would confirm or deny my theory. So then I spoke to university students and they are like, yeah, I'd go for that if I were you. So I'm just gonna tell you what I think but it definitely may not be correct. So shivering is also known as involuntary muscle contraction. And we all know, A-level biology students, muscle contraction is the cross-bridge cycle. The cross-bridge cycle requires ATP in several different aspects. If you get absolutely anything, you can't necessarily say where you can link to respiration or you can link to ATP or you can link to DNA or anything. Absolutely anything you cover is always gonna link back. So if you say insufficient supply of glucose means that you are unable to respire properly, which means you produce an insufficient supply of ATP. Therefore, the cross-bridge cycle cannot be carried out effectively which prevents us from shivering therefore our body temperature drops too low enzymes cannot function at their optimum rate and therefore we die because we get hypothermia hence it's important <laughs> so there you go i really do hope that helps you please do your own research and i really do wish you the very best of luck remember it is only two marks so don't stress about it if you don't want to but i really really hope this does help someone because i knew how much i was struggling when i was in your shoes last year so i wish you the very best of luck bye